Welcome, and today we are going to discuss audio frequencies and how it relates to audio design. Most people have heard that the human hearing range is from 20 Hz on the low end up to 20,000 Hz on the upper range, but that is actually just an approximation. Some people can hear in a larger range, but most people, especially as we get older, can hear much less than that. While we're accustomed to talking about the fundamental frequency that a person or instrument creates, nearly all sound sources also create harmonics, which are multiples of higher frequencies, but at a lower amplitude. For example, a middle C on the piano has a fundamental frequency of approximately 261.6 Hz, but it also produces quieter frequencies at 523.2 Hz, 784.8 Hz, and so on, generally getting quieter the higher you go in frequency. These other, non-fundamental frequencies are the harmonics, and to properly recreate any sound, you need to be able to reproduce both the fundamental and the harmonic frequencies. To help with designing audio systems, the standard frequency range is sometimes broken down into smaller pieces to help define the ranges that are being targeted. Starting at the bottom, we have the sub-bass range, roughly 16 to 60 Hz, where you get your bass sounds like a tuba or bass guitar. Bass, from 60 to 250 Hz, is actually our normal speaking range, disregarding harmonics. The lower mid-range, at 250 to 500 Hz, is where you'd find your typical lead instruments like a trumpet or alto sax. Mid-range is 500 Hz to 2 kHz, where you'd find your higher-pitched instruments like a piccolo. Once we hit the higher mid-range, at 2 to 4 kHz, we start to see the harmonics of those lower instruments like the trumpet. Next is what's called presence, from 4 to 6 kHz, where you get the harmonics for the higher instruments like the piccolo. Finally, brilliance is the highest subset, ranging from 6 kHz to 20 kHz, and is so high-pitched that this is usually filled with sounds more like whines and whistles. While not definitive, having the frequency range broken down like this can help in deciding what kind of speaker you need, depending on the range you're focusing on. With both microphones and speakers, their ability to record and reproduce sounds respectively are not fully linear. This shouldn't be surprising as most everyone is familiar with the large subwoofers that create lower sounds and the smaller tweeters to recreate high-pitched sounds. While that rough differentiation of low sounds need big speakers and high sounds need small speakers is generally right, it gets a little more complicated than that. Each speaker, buzzer, and microphone of any repute will have their frequency response tested and documented, and their results are usually shown on a frequency response graph such as this. This is for a speaker and is a comparison of the frequency on the x-axis and the sound pressure level on the y-axis. Sound pressure level, or SPL, can, for our intent, be interpreted as loudness. Since SPL is measured in decibels, you can note that on the graph, both the x and the y-axis are logarithmic. To test this, the speaker is given a constant power input at different frequencies, and the output is measured. For this example, you can see that it can't reproduce much below 100 Hz, peaks at a little less than 300 Hz, and then is fairly linear in its output between 500 Hz and 20 kHz. We can tell that the resonant frequency of the speaker is at that peak directly below 300 Hz, the frequency at which the speaker naturally wants to vibrate. As a 77 mm speaker, this response is what we'd expect. To test a microphone, the opposite is done, with the constant sound output measured and the microphone response measured. Microphones tend to have a more linear and wide-ranging response than speakers. Now that we understand the basics, we can apply these principles to speaker selection and enclosure design. For the speaker, you need to select our target frequency range and start searching for speakers that are ideal for that range, using the frequency response image provided for each speaker. As you do this, you will find that, besides size, the material used in the construction of the speakers has a surprising effect on frequency response. Speaker materials need to be light so that they can be responsive, but they also need to be stiff so they don't deform when moving. At CUI devices, we usually use paper and mylar as they're both light yet stiff. However, mylar is also resistant to moisture and humidity. Once the speaker is selected, an enclosure can emphasize or dampen the frequency response of a speaker, as its resonant frequency could be different than the speaker. A proper enclosure can reduce unwanted harmonics or act as a resonant cavity, often to exaggerate the lower frequencies that a smaller speaker may struggle with. In the end, there is no one speaker that will accurately recreate all sounds linearly. Depending on the application, where simple voice understandability is needed, one tiny speaker can do an excellent job. If trying to recreate the sound of a great concert hall, the speakers, enclosures, and acoustics of the targeted area will all come into effect. 
At times, a buzzer or siren that has an extremely limited frequency range, but can produce loud noises inexpensively, may be the ideal solution. I hope that this overview has helped you get started in the right direction as you undertake your next audio design project. If you have any questions or want to learn more about speakers, buzzers, microphones, and related components, check out our audio blogs on cuidevices.com.